Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions on health, wellbeing and sport. As ever, in order to get as many people in as possible, short and succinct questions and answers to match would be appreciated. Question number one, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in filling consultant vacancies at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary in the last 12 months. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. Consultant vacancies in NHS Grampian have decreased by 27.9 whole time equivalent or 41.5 per cent between December 2014 and December 2015. The Scottish Government increased NHS Grampian's resource budget by 6.7 per cent to 830.1 million for 2015 16. This is above inflation and the largest increase of any mainline, mainland board having previously increased by 4.6% in 2014-15. The Scottish Government works closely with all boards to support their staff recruitment efforts. Lewis MacDonald. The progress that's been made in filling consultant vacancies, does the Cabinet Secretary recognise that her Government's apparent decision to back away from its commitment to a major trauma centre at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary is causing great concern among clinicians there? Will she undertake to consult and listen to the views of clinicians in Aberdeen about the potential impact of this decision on their ability to recruit and indeed to maintain existing services? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there's uh, no backing away from anything. And of course, clinicians from all four uh, proposed major trauma sites have been involved in the work of the National Planning Forum from the outset and continue to be involved. It is important, however, that we try to reach a consensus among the clinical community, and I'm optimistic that that will happen. But we need to um, allow them to get on with the good work that they're undertaking. And, of course, I will be keeping a very close eye on these matters as they go forward. Thank you. Question number two, Richard Simpson. Government, what average number and percentage of hospital beds was unavailable to new patients in 2015? How this compared with the average number of bed-occupied days uh, uh, occurring because of delayed discharges? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the official statistics show that just over uh, 18,100 hospital beds in all specialties were occupied on average in the quarter ending September 2015. And in that quarter, the average number of beds occupied because of delayed discharge was 1,570. The average number of beds occupied because of delayed discharge has reduced by over 100 beds on the same time in 2014. Of course, tackling delayed discharge is one of the key priorities of this government. Our latest figures published last week show significant progress has been achieved with an 18 per cent reduction in delayed discharge in December 2015 compared to the year before. And this reflects the significant investment that we've made into tackling delayed discharge and improving the availability of social care, <clears throat> not least with the £250 million announced by the Deputy First Minister as part of next year's budget. Dr Simpson. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response and for the welcome the fact that the trend is once again downward. But in July 2011, at the beginning of this Parliament, the monthly figure of bed-occupied days was 20,000. The last available figures were 46,000. They are below last year, but still 46,000. And moreover, the total of bed-occupied days in England is 160,000. In other words, our bed-occupied days are three times as much as they are in England. So I just wonder, since we're celebrating the anniversary of the Cabinet Secretary's promise to end delayed discharges, uh, how, how she feels the progress is going to be made uh, over the next period. Cabinet Secretary. Well, we absolutely remain committed to uh, eradicating delayed discharge, and uh, that is absolutely the aim. I, I'm glad Richard Simpson recognised that there is progress being made. Um, in January uh, of this year, 606 um, patients were delayed over three days. That is a reduction of 19% from uh, 752 at December 2015 and a reduction of 21 per cent from the 766 in January 2014. And of course, standard delays over three days were never lower under the previous Labour administration. So this is a, an issue that is tough to tackle, but one that the integrated joint boards and of course the lead agency in Highland are absolutely committed to doing. We've seen progress already, so for example, in Glasgow, and the progress that they've made there, we want to see uh, everywhere. And that's why, of course, the investment in social care of 250 million is so important. Richard Simpson uh, mentioned 
the issue in England. Well, I, I don't know if he's seen the, the College of Emergency Medicine material <coughs> that has recently been produced, but they've been monitoring on a week-by-week -week basis some of the challenges in English hospitals. And one of the big challenges is the availability of care. And of course, they haven't invested the resources in social care that we've invested here. So I wouldn't use England as a, a model uh, to emulate. I think they have huge problems and will continue to have huge problems with the availability of social care. Thank you. Question number three, Mark MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what training is available for health professionals to provide health care to people on the autistic spectrum. Minister Jamie Hepburn. A priority of the Scottish strategy for autism is to improve the understanding of autism, focusing on effective education and training for all health care professionals. In partnership with NHS Education for Scotland, the Scottish Government has published an autism training framework. The framework enables all professionals working in the National Health Service to identify the level of autism expertise required for their role and thereafter access appropriate training to meet that need. Scottish Government funding for training and diagnostic tools has increased the number of practitioners involved in autism diagnosis to over 200 in Scotland. <laughs> NHS, NHS Education for Scotland are soon to publish a good practice guide for support and intervention in autism. The good practice guide will assist those working across health and social care to plan, adjust and adapt their services for people with autism. Mark MacDonald. I uh, thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, many individuals on the autistic spectrum can struggle with certain healthcare interventions uh, as the intrusive nature of examination can trigger a sensory meltdown. Um, in light of what the Minister has just said about the various uh, uh, packages and support measures that are available, can he advise what steps are taken to ensure that health boards promote these appropriately to those individuals working in their area? Minister. Well, uh, can I uh, thank uh, Mark McDonald for his question? I would uh, acknowledge his uh, interest in uh, these matters and uh, his assiduous uh, campaigning to uh, raise awareness of autism inside uh, this uh, parliament in order uh, for people with autism to be met with uh, understanding uh, all healthcare professionals need uh, a knowledge of autism appropriate to their uh, role. Uh, the NHS Education uh, for uh, Scotland has a, a learning space on autism and a range of resources that help support our workforce development. There is the training framework that I referred to in my initial answer, which outlines the, the knowledge and skills required of healthcare professionals from generic services through to those working in specialist autism services. It is my clear expectation, President Officer, that all NHS territorial boards should be ensuring that the staff who need to have that training should be made aware of that opportunity. Hopefully, my initial answer reassured Mr Macdonald and all members of this chamber that there is uh, plenty of uh, work underway, but I'm always uh, happy to hear from Mr McDonald or indeed any other uh, member about uh, suggestions as to how we can uh, make further improvements as well. Rudy Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask what proportion of the 6,000 um, rejected referrals to CAM services were from where of people suffering, young people suffering from autism? Minister. It, I can't give that specific uh, figure to Rudy Grant just now. What I can undertake to do is look at that uh, further and get back to in writing. I shall uh, do that. My uh, clear expectation, though, uh, presiding officer, is that uh, where any individual has been referred to CAMS and has had uh, their referral rejected, that uh, some form of support should be put in place. And I recognise that there is more for us to be doing in that regard. And that is why, as part of the uh, £150 million additional investment over the next five years, that we have announced into mental health services. That's going to be one of the key focuses uh, for us through that investment. Many thanks, Minister. Question number four, Leslie Brennan. Thank you. Can I ask the Minister, or the Cabinet Secretary, to ask the Scottish Government when Ministers last met representatives from the Dundee Integration Joint Board? Cabinet Secretary. On the 28th of January uh, this year, Dundee Integration Joint Board was represented at a development a networking session that took place for all integration joint board chairs and vice chairs uh, at which I participated. Leslie Brennan. Uh, thank you for that answer. Last Thursday, the SNP administration at Dundee City Council cut 3.5 million from the health and social care integration joint board budget. Dundee City Council is expecting to receive £7 million from the additional £250 million uh, funding to, for social care. And the Chief Executive has noted that £4 million of that is already earmarked to uh, cover planned staff costs, such as the uh, living wage. So can I ask what 
reassurances has the Cabinet Secretary sought regarding care packages, especially given the half a million pounds cut to care packages for people with learning disabilities? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, Dundee IGB's share of the 250 million will be 7.65 million. So after allowing for living wage and existing local authority social care costs, for example, the uh, NI and uh, pay increased costs of their own social care workforce, the IGB will have an additional 3.8 million to fund uh, its uh, investment in additional social care capacity and in the reduction in the charging thresholds. And of course, the important thing about the uh, living wage element of that will be the uh, number, the, the thousands indeed, of uh, social care workers in the city of Dundee who will receive the living wage. The living wage will uh, apply to around 40,000 care workers across uh, Scotland and many thousands of those will live in the city of Dundee and will benefit from that. I would have thought that's something the member would welcome. Thank you, Minister. Question number five, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government what ac action it is taking to alleviate pressure on the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Cabinet Secretary. Whilst there have been some challenges at the new Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, uh, uh, we should remember that the, this was, of course, an unprecedented migration of four hospitals to one campus. It did take place on time and on budget, and I want to pay tribute to local staff, some 10,000 of whom are working at the new facility for that achievement. Clearly, unscheduled care performance at the new hospital has not always been at the level that either the health board or I would have wished. Nonetheless, local staff have been working extremely hard with the full cooperation and support of the national unscheduled care team. As a result, the latest published weekly four-hour a &E performance was 91.9% for the week ending the 21st of February, up over 11 percentage points from the previous week and comparing the 12-week period to the 21st of February with the equivalent period last year, the new hospital has performed nearly 14 percentage points better than the previous sites. The Health Board remains committed to meeting and maintaining the national four-hour standard and we continue to provide all the support we can to that end. James Stone. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Could she confirm whether the establishment of the new hospital has led to an increase or a decrease in emergency and assessment capacity in Glasgow? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, there has been uh, an increase in uh, capacity and, of course, the new hospital has uh, developed as it has uh, gone on for the, the first uh, few months of its existence. So, uh, for example, one of the innovations that they have developed is the ambulatory uh, care unit, which adds capacity to the assessment unit uh, at the, the front door of the hospital. Uh, the winter period, I think, has been a testing time for all of the, the hospitals uh, across uh, the whole of Scotland and a testing time for those within Glasgow as well. But as the, the figures that I gave to James Dornan in my original answer show, uh, they are performing at a much uh, more uh, sustainable and improved position than they did uh, this, this time last year. Jackson Carlow. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Could I ask the Cabinet Secretary to pursue two relatively trivial matters which I believe would improve both the patient experience and that of my constituents visiting the campus? Firstly, there is rather poor signage on exiting the hospital. Lots of signage telling you where to go when you arrive, but not telling you how best to leave, with the result that many people are actually not necessarily departing from an exit which would afford them the speediest route home. I think that could be improved. And secondly, there's a rather swanky... Um, discharge lounge that has been prepared but unless you are being uh, uplifted by an ambulance there is no provision for a patient to be uplifted outside the discharge lounge with the uh, consequence that many patients are having to be wheeled some distance in all weathers to the multi-storey car park or to a taxi rank. I think with some subtle alteration the patient experience could be significantly improved if that could be Cabinet attended Secretary. to. I will certainly look into both of those suggestions and get back to the member. Briefly again, Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Uh, I'm just uh, seeking some clarification from the Cabinet Secretary that, uh, that actually there could be an opportunity for other hospitals in the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde area to help deliver services in conjunction with the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Cabinet Secretary, as briefly as possible. Uh, well, Stuart McMillan raises a good point, and of course, the new national clinical strategy really uh, points towards that of uh, hospitals working together and on a, the basis of a network, and uh, that's something that we want to take forward through the strategy. Many thanks. Question number, Scott, uh, question number six, John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet's uh, 
to ask the Scottish Government what measures it is taking to reduce waiting times in NHS Ayrshire and Arran. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has taken a number of actions to support NHS Ayrshire and Arran to deliver waiting times such as providing £2.6 million in 1516 to deliver outpatient and diagnostic test standards as well as the legal treatment guarantee and of course the board has also received £1.3 million from the National Unscheduled Care Fund and over £433,000 to help deal with winter pressures under the current financial year. John Scott. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. And the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that exactly 10 years ago I organised and led the march of 5,000 people in Ayr to keep the AE unit open at Ayr Hospital. And so I welcome the new facility opened last week at Ayr Hospital. However, the Cabinet Secretary will also be aware of occasional but regular spikes in numbers presenting at AE at Ayr and Cross House, as well as the 35 consultant vacancies in NHS Ayr Sanan, as well as recent difficulties in meeting government for our waiting time targets. Is she confident that even with the new facility, but given the lack of staff and the lack of available beds, that NHS Ayr Sanan will be able to meet its waiting time targets in future in A&E and other areas such as orthopaedics? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I also join with uh, John Scott and, of course, uh, recognising that uh, the A&E unit at Air Hospital was um, saved by the efforts uh, of those locally, but also by the efforts of this government, and uh, has led, of course, to a £27.6 million pounds bet building for better care project, which uh, has led to the, the new combined medical and surgical assessment units at both of the district general hospitals and the new emergency department at University Hospital Air. Uh, John Scott raises uh, uh, issues around spikes at a &E, and of course he's correct to, to point to that. And some um, a &E departments have more of a challenge with that than others. Air Hospital has a particular challenge and he outlines some of the reasons for that. However, it is operating still, having said that, at a better position this year than it had uh, last year, but there's more work to be done. And what we want to do once we're through uh, the winter period is to look at what more can we do to further improve the performance, particularly of those units which do spike and, and have more challenge in uh, de delivering a consistent service. So very happy to, uh, to keep uh, John Scott informed of that. Thank you. Question number seven, Gil Patterson. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to community services in the Clydebank and Mulgai constituency. Minister Maureen Mott. We are planning a single and new build facility in Clydebank delivered through the HUB programme with an overall funding envelope of £19 million. A new integrated facility for Clydebank already has widespread stakeholder support, including from local politicians and the local community planning partnership. Such a replacement health and care centre build would enable the co-location of multidisciplinary services, including integrated health and social care teams, within a new facility, giving one-stop access and improved accessibility for patients to an increased range of improved quality services. Thank you, Gil Patterson. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer and uh, say that I very much appreciate the fact that £19 million has been provided for the new health centre in, in my constituency, Clyde Bank. It's extremely well uh, been well welcomed uh, by the community in general. Can the Minister outline the Parliament to the Parliament what next steps will be or an update to bringing this much needed facility into fruition for my constituents in Clyde Bank? Minister. Well, uh, the initial agreement has recently been submitted to the NHS Capital Investment Group for review, and that will be considered later this month. Subject to approval being received, it is anticipated that financial close will occur in late 2017 and construction will begin in 2018. Thank you. Question number eight, Alison McInnes. Okay, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the recent child and adolescent mental health waiting time stats, showing that around half of patients in NHS Grampian waited over 18 weeks before being seen. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Uh, there has been a significant improvement in these waiting times over the last uh, few years, despite a significant increase in the number of people being seen. However, the Scottish Government is determined to continue seeing improvements so that all health boards, including NHS Grampian, meet our targets. The Scottish Government has invested significantly to develop mental health services with increased 
Staffing numbers and training are in post and long waits are being addressed. We have announced an additional £150 million for mental health services over the next five years to help bring down waiting times and deliver sustainable improvement to services. Through this substantial funding award, we are able to extend capacity, improve access to services and promote innovation and new ways of treating children and young people with mental health conditions, as well as psychological therapies for all ages. Thank you, Alison McInnes. I thank the Minister for his response, but it will be of little comfort to the young people facing an agonising wait for treatment in my region. Um, over the last year, the Minister has responded to my concerns by first telling me he had a new improvement programme, and then six months ago, a detailed recovery plan for NHS ground pain. Perversely, these have both resulted in a continued decrease in performance. Uh, given that, uh, perhaps I should be reluctant to ask the Minister what he plans to do next, but I'll give it a go. Uh, just what is the Minister planning to do to drive down um, these waiting times and bring about the drastic change that is needed in waiting times in Grand Pain itself? Minister. Well, uh, let me first of all focus on what's happened uh, in the most recent uh, quarter, uh, focusing on the, the figures uh, that... Uh, we are just referred to the total number of people starting treatment in the quarter ending December 31, 2015 has increased 7 per cent in the same period last year. That means more children and young people in NHS Grampian are being seen. I would accept that uh, the figures that had previously been published were not good enough. I am determined that we see improvements. There have been uh, some improvements in the uh, most uh, recent uh, figures. It is very encouraging to note that performance against the 18-week target uh, improved month and month during the final quarter of 2015, with 76% of people being seen within 18 weeks during December. There has been significant work to try and tackle uh, the uh, longest waits. I have set out uh, the range of investments that we have. I know that NHS Grampian take this responsibility seriously. We have seen the response. We have seen the figures uh, continue to improve, and it is my clear expectation that, that improvement will continue so that this target is met. Thank you. Question number nine, Jane Baxter. To ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure that frontline patient and carer support from alternative care providers can be maintained in light of the reduction in local authority budgets. Minister Jamie Hepburn. The integration of health and social care is one of Scotland's major programmes of reform. At its heart, health and social care integration is about ensuring uh, that those who use services get the right care and support whatever their needs at any point in their care journey. That is why our 2016-17 budget sets out pl our plans to transfer £250 million from the NHS to health and social care partnerships to protect and grow our social care services. This is on top of the £500 million we are already investing over three years to support integration of health and social care. In 2016-17, we are allocating over £8 million for carer support. This includes £3 million for the Voluntary Sector Short Breaks Fund and £4.75 million to health boards for carer information strategies. Much of the funding to health boards is distributed to the third sector, including uh, carer centres. Uh, the, government, the Scottish Government funding proposals for the coming financial year deliver a strong uh, financial settlement for local government. Jane Baxter. I thank the Minister for that response, but is he aware that the SNP Council budget in Clackmannanshire has imposed across-the-board cuts of 7.1% cash or 8.4% in real terms on third sector providers, including SAMH and many children's organisations? This is at a time when these organisations have been asked to pay a living wage and implement the employer's pension contributions of at least 2%. Does this not fly in the face of the government's stated commitment to the health and well-being of children and young people? Minister. No, I do not think uh, it does. I think this uh, government has a, a strong record in uh, commitment to uh, children and young people. Uh, I note the uh, original question relates to the area of carers. We have just uh, collectively, as uh, Parliament passed, I think, uh, excellent legislation in relation to the uh, Care of Scotland Act, with a strong focus on uh, the position of uh, young carers. I have set out the range of direct funding that we have uh, passed on to local government through, uh, through uh, to health and social care partnerships from the NHS through the £250 million allocation. I uh, that, think that, again, that is a, a strong commitment. We remain committed to uh, delivering on the ground for all of Scotland's people, including Scotland's uh, vulnerable. Thank you. Before we move on, I'm afraid we will not make much further progress unless questions and answers are much briefer. Question number 10, Alex Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is and whether there is a satisfactory level of support for older people in North Angus with dementia. Minister Jamie Hepburn. The new integrated authority is responsible for assessing, planning and commissioning the right level of support for all people with dementia in its four localities, including in North Angus as part of the additional £250 million announced for social care. Angus will receive an additional £5.34 million, including resources to support the growth in social care and to support implementation of the living wage and other 
social care cost pressures. Angus is taking a strategic approach to moving resources to its enhanced community support initiative, which has now been adopted as the new model of care for older people across Tayside. This approach reflects one of the Scottish Government's key themes in the new national clinical strategy, moving resources and services into the community and towards primary care. Alex Johnson. The Minister may be aware that, as a result of local circumstances, elderly mentally infirm care in the Montrose and District area is no longer available for those who live in that community. Given the importance of ensuring that such care can be found within the individual's own communities, is there anything the Minister can do to ensure that this situation is rectified as soon as possible? Minister. Okay, Alec Johnson, for uh, raising this issue, I would recognise it is uh, an important one. Local service planners were already aware that increasing rates of the dementia were challenging the capacity of services in Angus and that arrangements uh, needed to uh, be reviewed. Consequently, a, a multi-agency review of residential and nursing care will commence in April and report to the Angus uh, Integration Joint Board uh, on uh, completion. There is already a range of activity uh, underway to support uh, this uh, challenge, this uh, agenda. There are, for example, three community mental health teams for older people in each locality. Uh, there has been support from the Change Fund enabling Angus to enhance the dementia liaison team. Angus has had a post-diagnostic support service since 2004. There are over uh, 110 staff from health, social care and the voluntary sector as dementia ambassadors. But I recognise the particular issue that Alec Johnson has raised and it um, is on the radar of the integrated joint board and uh, the work is underway and will be reported back to them soon. Question number 11, Paul Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when they met, last met representatives of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and what matters were discussed. Cabinet Secretary. Ministers and Scottish Government officials regularly meet with representatives from health boards, including NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, to discuss matters of importance to local people. Paul Martin. I attended a meeting of the Save Lakeburn campaign group on Monday of this week. Uh, can I say also that the Chief Executive of NHS Greater Glasgow was also invited and he declined to attend the event? Uh, does the Minister share my concern that an official paid to the tune of a reported £190,000 per year uh, can take trouble not to attend this event? But when you look at the hospitality registered by uh, Mr Calderwood, you can see that a round of golf is something that he's quite keen to attend, but he can't take the time to attend an event in East End to assure local people that their local hospital will not be closing. Minister. Um, well, I'm not going to, to get into issues about um, um, individuals, um, but as I've said to Paul Martin uh, before, I know uh, local people very much value uh, the local uh, hospital. I also uh, know that from the correspondence I've had from uh, Parkinson's UK, um, which of course I have responded to. Um, assuring them that the, the contents of the draft discussion paper have not in any way been accepted as either concrete proposals by the board and, of course, none of which have come uh, to me uh, uh, for approval. And as all, as all, I've also made it very clear to Paul Martin previously that uh, you know, there would have to be some material uh, change to the position when Nicola Sturgeon was the Health Secretary in 2011, when she rejected what was a formal proposal at the time to close Lightburn Hospital because she'd heard repeatedly, not least from local patients and clinicians, that the hospital provided a high quality service that were greatly valued by uh, the local community. I did note that uh, in the Parkinson's uh, UK uh, submission uh, for the debate today that they were stressing very much that they did not want this to become a party political issue and they wanted uh, support uh, from, uh, from across the board and didn't want it turned into a party political issue. I think that's something perhaps we should all take notice of. Thank you. Question number 12, Christian Allard. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making in tackling delayed discharge in NHS Grampian. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Grampian has seen a 35 per cent reduction in bed days lost to delay in December 2015 compared to December 2014, the lowest level since April 2015, and the 35 per cent, uh, yeah, the lowest level uh, since April 2015. The partnership has received 2.73 million from the three-year delayed discharge funding. And I expect the partnership to utilise this money to develop community services aimed at reducing unnecessary emergency admissions and delayed discharges. Uh, 
Krishnamurti. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer and his welcome news indeed. What impact junior doctors have had in bringing this welcome reduction and uh, how much the protection of the existing deal for junior doctors we have here is helping NHS Grampian recent success? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the reduction in delays in Grampian um, is the result of the continued hard work and dedication of all health and social care staff across the partnership, including, of course, junior doctors. Uh, to ensure continued success, it is essential that professionals across health and social care continue to work together as part of a multidisciplinary team to maximise people's well-being and ensure they receive the right care in the right place at the right time. Nanette Milne. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that I introduced an amendment into the Carer Scotland Bill to the effect that discharge planning should start as early as reasonably possible on the patient's hospital journey. Does she know if any hospitals in Scotland are already adopting this approach? Because I, I think if it was successful, um, that, that would contribute significantly to the Cabinet Secretary. hospital discharge. Um, well, as I understand it, Dumfries and Galloway have been uh, looking and trialling this and I think will hopefully uh, provide some good practice uh, models for boards elsewhere, but happy to write to Nanette Milne with a bit more detail on what Dumfries and Galloway have been doing. Very briefly, Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. There's a continuing issue around high levels of cancelled operations in Grampian, which the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of. How far is that related to continuing levels of delayed discharge? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, cancelled uh, operations due to capacity issues remain a very, very small percentage. In the recent statistics, there was around 2.8%, which has remained pretty consistent uh, over uh, the last few uh, months. And, of course, any cancelled operation is, uh, is to be regretted. But, of course, there are circumstances when emergencies come in that will need to take precedence over uh, planned procedures, which is why, of course, we'll be investing £200 million over the next five Five years to develop um, um, further elective centres along the, the model of the Golden Jubilee Hospital. Question number 13, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government how it seeks to identify and acknowledge outstanding practice and contribution in the NHS. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we are committed to rewarding the outstanding and hardworking contribution of NHS Scotland staff to the delivery of high quality patient care services for the people of Scotland. Uh, unlike uh, in the other UK countries, in 2015 we accepted the recommendation of the pay review bodies of a 1% across the board uplift in pay for all NHS staff from the 1st of April 2015, thereby ensuring that NHS Scotland staff remain the, the best rewarded in the UK. This pay increase was supplemented by additional measures for the lower paid. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Over the last couple of years, my family have been very grateful for the professional health care provided by hospital staff. NHS Lothian organises an annual event to recognise outstanding health care practice, and there is one category which offers patients, carers and relatives the opportunity to nominate a health care worker who they believe is a true health hero. Will the Cabinet Secretary join with me in encouraging people in the Lothians to nominate a hard-working health care professional who has provided exceptional patient care. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, we should welcome any opportunity to recognise the hard work and dedication of staff across the NHS. That's why the Scottish Government works in partnership with the Daily Record every year to deliver the Scottish Health Awards, which recognise the outstanding achievement of staff across a range of roles and disciplines. Thank you. Question number 14, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government whether the new East Lothian Community Hospital will be fully operational by 2019 and provide at least all of the services that are currently delivered at Rudlands General Hospital. Cabinet Secretary. The timeline for completion of the new hospital remains unchanged and we fully expect NHS Lothian to welcome their first patients in uh, 2019. The new hospital will be the home to a range of services including inpatient continuing care beds, mental health and patient beds, orthopaedic and rehabilitation beds, uh, as well as shared therapies, including physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, dietetics and music therapy. NHS Lothian will have their full business case to the Scottish Government later this year. And in the process of doing this, some options and proposals for surgical services uh, are being discussed uh, with staff. This work links directly to the issue of maximising all of NHS Lothian's assets and ensuring the effective use of resources. 
NHS Lothian's clin local clinical objectives is to improve services in the local community, and I'm confident that this project will deliver on this. Thank you, Ian Gray. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I'm afraid the timeline uh, is not unchanged since this hospital was due to open in 2009, uh, but I'm glad to hear that there should be no further delay. Uh, however, there are discussions underway to reduce day surgery services, eliminating day surgery under general anaesthetic, and to cut bed numbers too. I have talked to staff about these already. They reject these proposals. Will the Cabinet Secretary tell the NHS that a new hospital should provide more, not less, services? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there will be surgical services at the new hospital. No final decisions have been taken on this matter, but a group has been established which brings together clinical and leadership experts, including surgeons, anaesthetists, endoscopists and theatre nurses, as well as uh, union colleagues. As part of this review, they will work together to uh, ensure uh, the, the best outcome uh, for patients. But uh, while NHS Lothian's business case is yet to be finalised, we're currently looking at circa 60 per cent increase in inpatient beds increase in inpatient beds from around 78 to around 132. Uh, so hopefully that will provide Ian Gray with the assurance that inpatient beds are increasing, not decreasing. Question number 15, Malcolm Chisholm. To ask the Scottish Government what progress NHS boards have made in recruiting extra specialist nurses and whether the resources allocated for that purpose have been fully spent. Cabinet Secretary. In 2015-16, this government invested over £2.4 million of recurring funding to improve specialist nursing and care, including the appointment of additional specialist nurses. Uh, NHS boards are responsible for ensuring that these funds deliver maximum benefit for patient care and are submitting regular progress reports on how these funds are being invested. NHS boards are in the process of recruiting additional specialist nurses or increasing the, uh, the hours of existing nurses and benefits are Patients are already benefiting from these changes. Malcolm Chisholm. Um, I welcome the MND nurses that we know about and hope that additional specialist nurses have been recruited for relatively common conditions such as MS and Parkinson. But in this week when we mark Rare uh, Diseases Day, can't you say whether any rare diseases have benefited from additional specialist nurses using models such as the single gene complex need specialist nurses that operate in Edinburgh and other cities? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, the, the specialist uh, nurses will cover uh, a range of conditions. I'm uh, very happy to uh, write to uh, Malcolm Chisholm with some of the detail, but I can see from the list of different specialist nurses employed by different boards that there is a, a wide range of specialism, spe, special, specialties covered uh, by those nurses. But I'm very happy to write to Malcolm Chisholm with the detail because it does run uh, uh, to quite, quite a lot of detail here, but happy to furnish him with that. Thank you. Question 16, Rob Gibson. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress there has been on the review of neonatal and maternity services. Sorry, Maureen Watt. Since the launch of the review last year, a chair has been appointed and the review group established. The re review group has now met on five occasions and is supported by four subgroups which were established in January this year. The subgroups focus on maternity models of care, neonatal models of care, workforce and evidence and data. In total, around 100 NHS staff, academics and other professionals and service user representatives are involved in the review main group and the subgroups. The review has a strong focus on engagement with events taking place with service users and with maternity and neonatal care professionals in each of Scotland's 14 territorial NHS boards. In addition, further engagement is planned with other interested stakeholders, including professional bodies, academics and third sector representatives. A communications plan, which includes a regular newsletter, blog, Twitter feed and website, is in place to inform a wide range of interests. Rob Gibson. I thank the Minister for that detailed answer. Uh, what recommendations are likely to be made for upskilling nurse practitioners and extra training for local GPs to back up maternity services in rural and remote centres? Minister. Our review group has, been set up, has set up a subgroup to specifically consider workforce issues in relation to maternity and neonatal services. The subgroup will provide recommendations 
to ensure we have a modern, flexible and efficient workforce that can deliver safe, effective and high quality maternity and neonatal services that puts mothers and babies and families at the centre of care. This will include consideration of the roles of workforce in remote and rural locations. Supplementary, Richard Simpson. Um, very briefly, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I just ask that as part of this review, the variation in stillbirth uh, levels, which were highlighted particularly for Ayrshire and Arden recently, uh, should be looked at very closely to, def to do, uh, determine why these significant variations occur. Minister. That is already underway. Thank you very much. That concludes uh, questions this afternoon. And we now turn to the next item of business, which is the debate.